BSI presents The Standard Show, the podcast that brings you the stories behind the standards with Matthew Childs and Cindy Paragill. Today's episode is on standards education. Hello and welcome to The Standard Show. My name is Matthew Childs and the aim of this podcast is to bring you the stories behind the standards. Now, recently here on The Standard Show and to mark International Women's Day, we chatted to leading academic Dr. Arena Brass from UCL, a university here in the UK, about her experiences as a standards maker. But in that conversation, Arena also gave us what was a really impassioned call to arms about the importance and practice of standards education. So we decided to pick up the baton handed to us by Arena and give a platform to some national standards bodies and for them to tell us about some of what they do for standards education in their countries. A bit of a standards education showcase. So in this episode, we'll go on a mini European tour, visiting Germany, Spain, Denmark and France before heading back here to the UK and on the way, speaking to colleagues from those national standards bodies in those countries. We'll hear them tell us why they believe standards education is so important, what they do to support it, a current project they're working on, Plus, we asked them to tell us where they believe standards education should go next. And of course, being the standards show, we like to get personal too. So we'll hear them describing their standards journeys. All aboard then. First stop, Germany. Okay, my standard story is kind of a long thing and I need to really start from the beginning. This is Amelie Leiprand of German standards body DIN, who heads up DIN's Young Professionals Network. The beginning was after I graduated from school, there was no standardization at all in my life. There was no engineering at all in my life. I wanted to become an actress and that's what I did. I went to drama school and after four years, I graduated from drama school and I worked as an actress for eight wonderful years in different theaters. And during the last year, it happened to me that I realized, wow, that's it. I've gotten everything I wanted from this job. Now, there's nothing more for me to gain. Time to move on. And I decided to quit theater world and I wanted to change my universe completely. And, and, and I decided, well, let's try if my brain still able to do something like, you know, real. And I started studying mechanical engineering and my brain turned out to be able to do this. So after six years, I got my master's in mechanical engineering and I started working as an engineer and I found I hated it. <laughs> I thought this is just not, not possible for me to be sitting in front of my computer talking to the machine or to my testing machine or doing the calculation. It's just, that just doesn't work for me. And uh, I had a former boss back then and he was really sweet and I, I was sort of, you know, really devastated and I was like having a, a short prey to the universe telling it, I, I have no idea where to look for a job, but I need a job where my both professions can live. I cannot be only an engineer. And my former boss, like literally two days later, he came to me and said, well, uh, I'm so sorry, don't have the money to pay you anymore, but I'm so sorry. And we have contact here and there and science here and, you know, engineering there. And I was like, oh, I'm too bad. But you know what? I don't really feel so, so happy being an engineer. I rather talk to people and he was like oh if you prefer talking to people why don't you try dean because they had been doing a standard with dean like a couple of years ago before my time at this company and he told me it was always nice there nice atmosphere and you'd be definitely talking to people and i thought what universe <laughs> you sure <laughs> but i thought i trust you and i applied for the job and there i am and totally happy because I ended up in the innovation department. So my job was to give talks, to go out to people who had never been working with standardization. So I was talking to people again in a huge amount. I needed my mechanical engineering background, obviously, because I needed to be able to be, you know, talking on an engineering level with the people, but still I needed to be able to communicate with people what's not the 
first, um, you know, talent of most engineers. <laughs> and, um, and after like one or two years, something at Dean happened, which made me realize just how wonderful and how powerful this universe is and how much I, I love to be part of it and how much I, I, I think it's my mission to go out and tell people because I, I can. I'm the type of person to go out and tell people it. <laughs> so I should do that. Standardization in Germany is a bit differently organized than you may use, be used to it in, in Britain because um, as far as I know, BSI covers every topic, whereas in Germany we are split. So Dean is like the everything else part and we have the electrotechnical part um, covered by DKE. So DIN is obviously the much larger part and there's obviously a lot of uh, interconnection between the two of us because, you know, um, since, thanks to digitization and industry 4.0, there's a lot of interconnection between machines and the electrotechnical part. But it's historically, it's two different um, associations. I didn't learn anything about standardization during my studies. Of course, we worked with standards, but that's something different than knowing standardization. And after a couple of years at Dean, when I started to realize what universe there is to discover in standardization, how important it is to our world, how much our society is based on the rules, not only created in the societal level, on politics, but also on the technical level created in standardization. I th since then, I'm kind of on a mission <laughs> to try to get it out in the world and make it uh, available for universities and for education and start with engineers, obviously, because this is, you know, like, like lowest hanging fruit, but I think it's important for everybody. Dean does several things. We do have an, our own like little... Mm, education like a mini master so to speak it's called um, standardization expert and we've been offering this for over 20 years now every dean employee goes through this but it's also open for everybody else and there are each time we do it there is like one or two external people from uh, from the economy um, being there as well but it's not like you know widespread for everybody and now we are right now um, rethinking this uh, standardization expert modules to make it more up to date and make it available for more people. And on the other hand, I am doing what I do best. I am telling stories. <laughs> so I, I created a little podcast series out of 12 little snippets, each like 10 minutes. Um, I called it... Um, Human beings are not ends, what you never wanted to know about standardization, but definitely should know. And in this little podcast, I'm telling what standardization is. I'm, I'm telling the stories about, around it. I'm trying to um, include it into the whole system. What's, what's there about standardization? You know, there's so much more coming after this. All the certification, um, accreditation, all the um, quality infrastructure thing and all that is based on standardization. So I'm trying to shed a light on this so that I hope to get as many people as possible to listen to this and understand what they are missing. And so in the second step, I will go to the universities and try to create modules, standardization for engineers, standardization for economic people, standardization for legal people, you know, like all these different types of modules. The most important cohort of students we are most interested in is um, obviously engineers and all those um, I'd call it modern engineering style, you know, the environmental engineering um, or the, the I want to change the world types of people because they need to know that in order to change the world, they need to address the standardization as well, not only politics. But in the end, um, I think standardization should be taught to everybody. I mean... When it comes to like political sciences, there is a focus on institutions and why isn't standardization included there? I don't understand really. So I'm currently working on a project with a um, college in Regensburg, which is in Bavaria. And a new professor there is trying or is setting up his um his um, teaching and he's including standardization in a big amount and so we are doing a series of um, seminars in the summer term starting in middle of March 
uh, right to the end of June every week, one seminar on standardization. And I'm preparing this with him. And we are going to have it online. Obviously, there is still no, no guarantee that Corona is going to be over by then. And that gives us the chance to record it and then in a second step to digitize it in a good way and maybe already have a first module. I do hope that standardization becomes a very normal part of education and that in like a 10 years, everybody will, li will listen to my podcast saying, well, this is nothing new. What I loved about the standards show is like you're including all types of stories because you're on the one hand, you're um, inviting colleagues of yours to talk about what standardization looks like on the the standards maker side. And on the other uh, hand, you're including experts. So they tell their stories about the what does it mean for my company? What does it mean economic wise? And so it includes all different as aspects of standardization. So that's mechanical engineer, former actress, now standards educator, and also fellow podcaster, Amelie, talking about some of the current standards education taking place in Germany through DIN, and some of the plans she's putting in place for the future. And of course, her very kind words about the standard show. Thank you, Amelie. Okay then, next stop, Spain. Well, my standards journey started 20 years ago. Daniel Masso, Head of Knowledge for Spain's National Standards Body, UNE. Um, I thought initially that it was going to last for just a few months until I, I found something uh, more funny. But uh, <laughs> uh, the fact is that I fell in love with, with the standards and the standardization. Uh, I started... Um, to, to te, as a technical officer uh, related in the, in the technical committees related to to forestry because I'm a forest engineer and uh, and environmental issues and I was moving in in different places I I was working as head of unit in in chemistry and fuels and and other things so I've been moving around the standardization world for 20 years um, and I'm still in love with it so I'm quite happy about that. Standards education is key for UNE. Um, it's key in our strategy, both in our old strategy, which started in 2019, and also in our new strategy, which will last until 2025. Uh, basically, it supports many of our key activities. We think it's, it's like a an activity we need to support many other things. For instance, uh, we need to educate about the sanitation to improve our internal procedures. We need to educate uh, about the sanitation to attract young people to our technical committees, to improve the use of standards by the public authorities or standards in public procurement, So, which are, all of them are, are key act activities for us. So, so let's say that um, education is a horizontal issue, which is reflected in, in our strategy and in our management plan with, with some indicators, and, and it's key for us, and I think it will be key for us in, in the following years as well. We have like um, a set of activities. Uh, we started like joining um, a group of professors from the universities. Um, we follow the advice given by ISO in, in a book that they published, which is about teaching on standardization. And we created this uh, forum with, with people from universities and we decided like a set of activities. And these activities, uh, some of them were short term, like for instance, we started like a, an academic prize for thesis, uh, for master thesis and so on related to standardization. Uh, we decided to do some a congress about education and standardization in Spanish. Uh, and we decided to do like other activities supporting, for instance, um, we created some educational material for teachers in Spain and we created a, a training course for professors in, in Spain. Um, 
this was suggested by by them by the professors and and it was a very big success we've given like uh, five editions um, to different universities and and we are quite happy because we train the teachers on how to incorporate the standards and the standardization into into their classrooms into their lessons so by doing this we we reach a, a much higher number of students than we could ever reach if we do it just by ourselves in spain the university system is uh, quite ex- intensive because uh, many what we call the autonomous communities which are like small regions in Spain the small parts in Spain they have their own uh, universities so overall i think there are close to 200 universities counting public and private universities um we cooperate directly with uh, not many of them i would say around 20 more or less around 20 20 universities but they are the bigger ones for sure uh, but we distribute the standards to almost all of them because there is a uh, memorandum of understanding uh, between between the distributor of, of Spanish standards and um, and the association of all, all the universities so so we provide them we provide the universities and the students uh, access to to the full catalog of of spanish standards uh, to around 93% of spanish students in universities which is quite a, a nice figure and uh, and i think both parts are are quite happy with this kind of agreements we are working on on different projects uh, both in international and in in national uh, side international we are linked with um, uh, with some entities with with our uh, same objective or same purpose which is basically to to impulse or to promote education about the sanitation in, in universities. And uh, we do it, for instance, via a project uh, which is uh, called uh, Finest. Well, it's a proposal. It's not a project approved yet, but, but we cooperate with these kind of networks uh, very actively. We cooperate with ISO, IEC, and, and everybody who has um, activities on education about the sanitation we share our, our experiences with the colleagues in in other organizations for instance in Denmark or or in other countries and uh, at national level um, we also have some some projects for instance we we try to um, uh, to develop uh, educational games we did uh, in fact did a escape room a virtual escape room that it can be played for free it's a, it's an app or or you can even play without downloading the app and uh, and we are always open to to new activities our future is uh, quite challenging and quite promising both uh, i don't know if this is contradictory but uh, this is the way i see it uh, on one hand we need to to increase um, the the level of engagement uh, with our universities um, so we have a very close relation with with professors and with many students and so on but we need also uh, to have a closer relation with uh, the top managers or the uh, the deans or or whatever the responsibles of, of the university so we are going to start uh, like a new forum let's say high level forum uh, with universities and and this is our immediate future um, and at the same time we have to keep on pushing the activities that we are doing so so this is what we need besides that we need also to 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 move the education about the standardization not only to universities but to other entities like business schools and also to promote it in in vocational education and training because it it plays a a very very key role in some aspects for instance we've seen that um and now there is a huge need of knowledge on um how to use the standards in public procurement uh, you know in europe there there are these uh, 
plans for recovery and so on, and it involves a lot of public procurement, and standards will play a role in public procurement. And uh, but but there is still um, a lack of knowledge, and it's a barrier for for many civil servants to use standards in in the tenders. Uh, the same might be applicable to legislation. Probably not so urgent and, and and probably not so required, but but it's it's something similar. So basically, we have like this uh, three lines. First, high level uh, forum with universities, and and second, extend the education to to other um, to, to outside the universities, to business schools, and and to vocational training. More focus on on civil servants. We have a a full line of education for civil servants. There are some challenges uh, in on how to deliver our, our, our education. We started uh, our training courses around seven years ago um, with normal, let's say normal, like classic standards presential courses. Uh, but now we are all shifting and the world is shifting to, to more online uh, courses. So, and in online, it's, it's a new world and, and there are many, many possibilities. You can do a uh, just uh, online, but live online. You can do these uh, massive online open courses. Uh, you can do blended activities. So, um, so we still have to decide on on how to deliver each of these training courses. We have uh, started um, with uh, different uh, pilot projects uh, with <laughs> with these different modalities of of uh, uh, training and. Uh, well, it will be uh, probably included in our strategy how to which is the best way to, for each uh, training course and so on. Um, what we also need is to um, to make more practical activities. We in the standardization when we started, we were uh, so happy attached to to our theory on how to develop a standards and so on, and uh, we realized that everybody wants the the exercises and practical issues. So so we are developing many exercises and case studies, for instance, for business schools. It's it's key that you have these case studies. So um, so this these are our challenges. Uh, to really know how and, and to really incorporate uh, more practical exercises on, on the practical use of standards and on the practical development, not, not just theory, not, not just a presentation, PowerPoint with, with some things, but uh, hands-on <laughs> issues. Daniel Masso from UNE there, talking about how they engage with the universities in Spain, such as through their train-the-trainer approach and how that's being extended to include other stakeholders, such as civil servants. Now, we also heard Daniel talk about an escape room game. Well, here's someone who thought he could escape, or in his words, would walk away from standards after a few months. But as he says, he fell in love. And he's still passionate about standards some 20 years later. So, next stop, we're heading north to Denmark. Well, my standards journey started actually before you could say that I worked at Danish Standards because I have a background working for the Technical University of Denmark, where I was involved in international partnerships and research advisory services. This is Panila Bengston, a consultant at Danish Standards, responsible for developing their approaches and strategies for engaging with universities. My standard journey began in 2010 when I was employed at Danish Standards. So this means that I got involved And this in is Sina Anedabu, a project manager at Danish Standards, who works in the field of standards research, innovation and education. Standardization spans so many fields that it's difficult to get tired of, as there's always something new to learn. I mean, there's literally standards for everything, from washing label symbols to windmills. But even though my background is in engineering, when I graduated, I knew very little about standards and how important they actually are in society. So for me, it was quite an eye-opener to learn about standards. And this is the main reason why I am very passionate about giving this knowledge on to students and young professionals. Because once you start learning about standards, you found out that the world is truly built on standards. Standards education is important to Danish standards because we operate in a, for the benefit of society as an organization 
And it is our ambition to contribute to a sustainable, but also a safe society and a business community for people, the environment and the market. So for that reason, educating students and future engineering and technology students about standards is key to Danish standards. Because we know that students, if they know about standards and why international standards are important, they will also you know, contribute to developing sustainable solutions uh, that can also uh, you know, be spread out to the wider society and to the world. So in a way, you could say that the globalized world cannot exist without standards and supporting for supporting cooperation, trade, health and economic growth. And it's important that students know about this already uh, when they're at the university or college level. Also, we have an emphasis on education because students, they enter the real world and they have to use the standards. They have to apply them both practically and strategically. And for that reason, it's important for them to have insight into standards. And also some of them need to have specific in-depth knowledge about standards, uh, which could be within a particular specific area, could be within the medtech area, for example. And then we also know that many employers, they want candidates with knowledge about standards. And this has been highlighted by Lego, for example, that have been very outspoken about the importance of standards education. Standards education is very important to Danish standards because standards have a very big role to play in creating a greener and also more sustainable future. That means for us, it's crucial that we teach students and also young professionals how they can use standards as a tool to support, for example, green transition, the European Green Deal, and also, of course, the UN Sustainability Development Goals. In addition to this, not only using standards is interesting, also participating in standardization is highly relevant for students and young professionals, because we need to make them aware that they can actually make a difference and an impact by participating in standardization, hereby setting the standards of tomorrow. We are also currently seeing standards making a difference, for example, in creating more sustainable buildings, but also, for example, in regard to plastics, where standards support EU strategy to increase, increase the amount of recycled plastic used in production. Danish standards supports standards education by developing education materials and tools and methods, and we also deliver guest lectures. In the past, we have uh, delivered between five to eight guest lectures at different engineering colleges and universities, which have covered many different topics, such as introduction to standards, food safety standards, machinery, directive, CE marking, harmonized standards, medical device uh, regulation and standards, quality management standards, and so on. But with a growing demand that we've experienced and with limited human resources, because we're only a few people at Danish Standards focusing on standards education, we've had to change our approach to standards education and start develop digital education materials, because this will allow us to reach a wider audience across the whole country. We have eight universities in Denmark and many colleges that also want their students to know about standards. So digitalizing our education efforts is very important in order for us to reach a growing demand. In addition, we have also uh, developed strategic partnerships with uh, three Danish universities that teach within the engineering disciplines. And this is to achieve long-term impact, but also to have a continuous dialogue and buy-in both in the development of the teaching materials and tools that we are busy with, but also to meet the demands and needs and also help build the capacity of the educators at these institutions. So in a way, you could say we are very demands-driven and focus on developing materials that meet the needs of the education system right now. And then obviously there is a growing demand for digitalizing education as a whole in the, throughout the country and I guess in the world. To support standards education, we have a dedicated webpage called ds.dk slash uni. The page is aimed at students, young professionals and teachers. It has a range of different teaching material, most of which can be downloaded for free. Some of the material is about standards in general, but we also have topic specific material, for example, on management standards. We have on medical devices and we are con continuously adding material to the web page. So that means that 
all the time, we'll be adding new areas and specific topics uh, to be used as teaching material. We also have, in cooperation with a handful of other standardization bodies in Europe, we have developed a textbook called A World Built on Standards. The book gives you an introduction to standards and standardization, and it's in English. So everybody that are curious about reading it can download it on our webpage. We've also developed quizzes, games, videos, and all kinds of other fun stuff that can be used for standards education. Currently, I'm working on a project with the Technical University of Denmark, where we are participating in the development of a special course offered at the university in safety and reliability in robotics and automation. Uh, DTU, is, which is a technical university, is one of our strategic partners, so we were very happy to be involved in this uh, special course. What we are doing is that we're contributing to the development of the course content and also developing lectures about standards, machine safety and CE marking. And hopefully this uh, collaboration would lead to a lot more interaction and a closer connection between the university and ourselves. And then in addition, I'm also contributing to the development of a Nordic Young Professionals wor Workshop, focusing on how standardization can support the sustainable development goals and how particularly standards development is important with regards to sustainable mobility, which is now really important given the current situation in the world. We live in a highly changeable world where organizations need to be prepared to act fast in uncertain situations. Using standards can increase the resilience and robustness of organizations when facing critical situations. And this, as you all know, is something that we have been experiencing a lot lately. For example, standards for medical devices have been used widely during the COVID pandemic. This includes standards for face masks, surgical gloves, medical equipment at hospitals, and likewise. Standards also play a key role in global trade and in securing stable supply chains. And of course, also, standards can help organizations become more robust by helping them set up a system for managing digital information and giving guidelines on cybersecurity. As you can hear, the examples are many, but one thing is certain, standards have an enormous impact on the world of today and tomorrow. So we need to make sure that students and young professionals have the knowledge they need to build the future. So for me, uh, the future for st standards education is that we need to educate a lot more about the link between sustainable development and standards and how standards is a very important tool that can support the sustainable development goals and the transition into a much more sustainable world. And it's important because young people are attracted to these subjects. And it's important for us as standards developing organizations to attract young people and to get them involved with the standards making for the, for the future. So that was Penila and Sina from Danish Standards talking about the imperative of standards education at universities and for young professionals because of the role of standards in helping to tackle some of the big policy challenges facing us all and also how standards education is so valued by employers. It was also interesting to hear how they're shifting their approach to developing more digital resources to meet the demands and needs of the universities in Denmark. Next stop... France. My standard journey um, is maybe a little particular <laughs> because um, everyone told me that I would end up working uh, at AFNOR. Adil K.A. Magna Bosco from the French national standards body AFNOR. Maybe I should explain that my PhD thesis uh, was about uh, Polish standardization public policy, a study of Poland's accession to the European Union. And the comparison of the European technical harmonization policy with the evolving Polish technical policy has been my prism to observe the systemic transition in Poland so that everybody told me that I would end up working not, working not only with AFNOR, but at AFNOR. So apparently it was a kind of predictable journey. Standards education is important to AFNOR because we are innovation-oriented and future-oriented and because any professional can find themselves being a beginner 
when it comes to standardization. Standardization is a service provided by standardization organizations. And it is a t one of the tools for innovation. And we believe that innovation must be supported and raising aware awareness of the value proposition of standardization belongs to our missions. The use of standards improve the competitiveness of companies and standards are a good tool for public policies so that uh, the commitment to standardization both of private and public uh, actors is a kind of a lever for competitiveness and sovereignty and we must have people <laughs> know it <laughs> and uh, so the in their innovation journey we we have to support them to to to, to help them and to to facilitate the path of both private and public sectors in the collaborative uh, development of standards so we 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 need to provide them a innovation toolbox and uh, let's say uh, have them understand or um, that uh, standards is uh, belongs to the range of uh, the innovation toolbox or the the public policy tools so we we want to help them to to support them and to train both professionals and future professionals in standardization to support standards education what do we do at afnor um we have a range of, of, of actions. We train our partners, our customers and clients, both the standards makers and the standards users. And we have a, a business unit de devoted to vocational training. Uh, it's called AFNOR Competence, which means after com AFNOR competencies or AFNOR skills. So it's in a view of uh, vocational training and continuing education. We provide an access to standards at preferential rates for educational institutions, for universities and, and, and schools, for instance. It's called AFNOR COBAS Education. It is very important uh, for, for the students and for their teachers to have access to the real content of, of standards because, because it's, it's pretty difficult to teach something about standardization and, and, and standards uh, if you don't have access to the real document and the, the real standardization deliverable. So we had previously also a, a program of training of trainers, including, of course, uh, teachers uh, and, uh, and managers at, in, in schools. And uh, we have been designing uh, all together uh, with uh, with colleagues and with uh, partners, a kind of a non an online serious game on innovation, including um, uh, both uh, both the aspects of standardization and uh, intellectual property. So it is designed with our partners for a larger audience, larger public. It is available both in English and in French. You can find it um, on your on your um, uh, app stores. Uh, it is really designed to be used, for instance, for for mobile in, on on your mobile phones, and it's uh, a, a series of four episodes, uh, thirty minutes each, and you would accompany the main character in her digital uh, adventure. Let's say it's a kind of a digital learning story, um, and the the main character, she's named Emma, she's inventing uh, something and she has a very good idea and she wants to develop it into a real business project and uh, she will follow the usual stages of the innovation, innovation process and you, would, you will accompany her, the, the character. We would like uh, to develop um, a community of users of this uh, digital learning story about innovation, including standards and uh, patterns and so on. And uh, the idea is that uh, if um, if those communities use, use the game, we could uh, evolve it and um, d develop it and have it improve it and adapt it to the to the needs. So we we try and we would like this game, you know, to to be really uh, a success, uh, but if if it needs to be improved, we will be happy to have it <laughs> improved. So we try and present it to school directors, to students, to 
various communities. And so that's, that's uh, my main goal as regards uh, teaching or uh, <laughs> uh, education about standardization uh, this year in 2022. <laughs> Our primary audience is the standards makers and future standards makers and users and which means that it's not only uh, those who will be the standards makers in the future or who will manage the innovation uh, uh, policy of, of a firm, but also those who will use the standards. So we, we, that's also what we hear from the needs, I, I, I would say, let's say from the, from the market. What is the need? It's to provide skills about the content, about, about the, the standards content. So we, um, we focus um, on the, let's say, technical universities for, for that aspect of uh, the, the content, uh, the standards content. And uh, we try and adapt to the needs, uh, for instance, as regards uh, the, the highest schools from management, as regards those, those who would, who will in the future manage the innovation in the firms and uh, decide upon the resources affected to standards and so on. What about the future? Well, we, we have to think uh, vocational training. We have to think development of skills for everyone. We all need to develop our skills. And this is what we hear from the schools and university management. Please help us develop the skills related to standards for our future professional. This is very important to, to develop this kind of uh, different uh, tools to develop st standards related skills for um, various audiences, but also we have to anticipate the smart standards evolution. The evolution from uh, standards as a kind of a document uh, towards uh, standardized content. And we will have to develop the skills associated with these standards of the future. A deal there, talking about the importance of standards education because, in her words, standards are a tool for innovation and help to deliver public policy and also telling us about the way AFNOR approaches standards education as vocational education and training. It was also nice to hear that, personally, for Odile, it seems that working at AFNOR and in standards was always meant to be. OK then, our final stop on this tour. Actually, Matthew, I think I'll take over here. Our final stop on this tour, the UK. Well, I guess the first thing to say is there is there's no UK education system. Education is a devolved policy, so there are different systems for England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. This, of course, is Matthew Childs, BSI Education Manager, and we're turning the tables on him here, from host to guest. My standards journey... I suppose it's only fair after asking this question of so many guests on the podcast so far that I should have the tables turned on me to answer it myself. Well, I guess it's a uh, it's a long and winding one, really. I've worked in education policy and education communications for well over 20 years now, and I've done this in government and for government agencies and charities and also in the private sector. But I guess if there's a thread between all the things I've done it's been about developing relationships and partnerships between education providers and employers and creating really good quality materials to support these. Uh, before that, though, I actually started my career at a professional football club, uh, West Bromwich Albion in the West Midlands. Um, boing, boing for any Baggies fans listening. Um, and I've also done stints in research and evaluation. And I took some time out, a bit of a career break uh, to do a PhD in politics. Um, but I suppose the journey to where I am now at BSI started about a decade ago when I was working for a professional body in education. And obviously standards, standards of competence for practitioners play a really important role in professional bodies. So you could say that was a brief flirtation with standards, um, but it did eventually lead to where I am now. And uh, after six years at BSI, I suppose I am, 
I'm totally smitten with standards, I guess. Why is standards education important to BSI? Well, standards education is something we've done for a really long time. We've had an education function for well over 60 years. And it's important because well, we think young people need to understand about standards, you know, what they are and how they shape and influence the world around us. You know, no matter what their chosen career path or the organization they end up working for or the industry they work in, they're going to end up using or benefiting from standards. Um, but it's more than that. For standards to be successful, they need to draw on the widest range of expertise and opinions as possible. So we also want young people to get involved in standards, to bring their, their bright ideas and fresh perspective to the world of standards making, to help shape the future. So standards education for us is about promoting the value of standards participation too. So what do we do to support standards education? Well, a few examples here. Uh, we offer guest talks to universities, either face-to-face -face or virtually. Now, these are delivered by BSI colleagues or experts from our standards committees, either about something general or tailored, you know, to, to suit the needs of particular university teaching programs. So some of these talks have been on the impact of standards on trade or productivity or innovation and growth. Uh, we've also done talks on the history of standardization and how standards are made, and even just about the role of, of a national standards body. Um, we also run a student research program where we provide mentoring for master's level dissertation projects that involve standards in, in some way or a major way. Uh, and this level of mentorship will vary depending on the project. And these are great because through these projects, we can get sort of really valuable information about an area of, of interest for our standards work, be that for our sector teams or, or our standards committees. And the students obviously get me mentorship from BSI colleagues, but also the chance to demonstrate the practical application of their work, as well as get some really great national and international exposure for it. Um, Another example of our standards education work is our public committee meetings. Now, pre-COVID, we'd taken standards making on the road and partnered with UK universities to co-host these public committee meetings. Now, here we'd invite the public, students, local businesses and other, other local stakeholders to come and, at and attend and, and see what happens in a committee. And we time these events to coincide with public consultations for the particular standards. So if you attended the event, you actually got to take part in developing the standard. And it's a, a really nice way to shine a spotlight on how standards are made. Now, as we're emerging from the pandemic, we really hope to return to these. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, we developed a short online course called the Power of Standards, which has three modules. Uh, these are about what standards are why they matter and how they're made. And over the last, last year or so, we've really wanted to develop more online and interactive teaching support materials. So this course is now joined by some infographics on key sectors and also some video content too. And I suppose um, I've got to say most recently, this very podcast uh, where we are bringing listeners the stories behind the standards to inform, educate and hopefully entertain too about standards. And we put all of this stuff, all of these materials in one place at bsigroup.com forward slash education. Um, separately, we do offer uh, universities via a special subscriptions rate access to British Standards Online, which is our database of all UK, European and international standards. And this is so that academics and students can access the raw material, if you like, uh, giving them the flexibility to use standards themselves in their degree programs and research. So a current project we're working on, well, I suppose I'd want to highlight a project taking place as part of the student research program. Uh, it's a research project on the future of standards in artificial intelligence, and it's a six month group project working with students who are on the Masters of Public Administration at UCL. And though it's co-created between us and the students, it's really very much led by them. Um, the key thing here is that although it's their master's project, we'll get a report with some fantastic practical recommendations for us. So it really blends research and consultancy, really. And it builds on previous successful group projects we did with UCL on the Internet of Things and on medical devices.
So uh, in terms of what's next for us in terms of standards education, well, definitely development of more resources to support standards teaching, uh, particularly online and interactive materials to help universities bring standards to life in their programs. And this is based on, on the feedback we've got from them. Um, definitely doing more podcasts too, obviously. Um, but also a couple of years back, we decided we wanted to strengthen our university partnerships in some of our key strategic sectors here at BSI. And the first one of those is in healthcare technologies. Actually, Matthew, I'll pick this up from here. Emma Glass, BSI University Partnerships Manager for Healthcare Technologies. So my standards journey, uh, I am relatively new to BSI. I joined just under a year ago. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was working in the publishing industry. So um, very much focused around uh, working with finance sector, uh, publishing books and focus reports to do with uh, banknotes and uh, big data. So so the, the health sector was a big change, but a, a really welcome change, actually. Um, so that once I moved away from finance and, and started working with um, in the healthcare sector, it was more so collaborating with academics and really to see the academics kind of passion and enthusiasm for their research and their teaching is really motivating and such a pleasure. Um, so so the, the role at BSI now collaborating uh, on university partnerships is, is really great to be continuing that um, relationship and, and continuing to learn and work with academics as they uh, focus on their research. Um, in terms of my standards journey, I think I still have a lot to learn, but I'm really excited and, and looking forward to, um, you know, I think I've barely scratched the surface. So looking forward to seeing where that will take me in collaboration with the universities. So why is BSI strengthening university partnerships in healthcare technologies? Well, we're doing this because universities are at the heart of innovation and the healthcare technology space is fast paced and constantly evolving. So for us to understand the future areas for standards development, we need to be having the right conversations at the right time and really supporting research how best we can. There are a couple of what reasons why this is focused around healthcare technologies. So firstly, as the national standards body, there is already a wealth of work and expertise in this area. So it's not a case of starting from scratch with the partnerships. Then there is also the impact to consider. So healthcare technologies need to be developed quickly, safely, and at a cost affordable to society. And it's only through these partnerships we can make a real difference to ensure faster diagnosis, uh, patient safety, and ultimately a healthier population. I should say partnerships with universities are not new for BSI. So our relationship with universities is extensive and has been going on for a really long time. For example, there are over a thousand academics in our standards makers communities representing over a hundred UK um, universities. So, so we're really just uh, taking these, these relationships to the next level with these new university partnerships. So in terms of how we're strengthening these partnerships, well, we're doing this in two ways. The first way is by supporting emerging research. And the second is engaging with students and researchers to really raise awareness of the role of standards. In terms of the first way through supporting emerging research, um, we're partnering with universities on research proposals. So together we can address the key challenges in emerging healthcare technologies research and identify solutions through standardization opportunities. In terms of the second way, we are partnering with universities through that student and researcher engagement. And personally, for me, this is the particularly rewarding part. So getting to kind of go out there and meet the students, meet the researchers and have that in-person uh, collaboration is, is really, really exciting. Um, and obviously, you know, um, these, are, these are the next generation of, of standards makers and standards users. So to be able to have that um, collaboration is, is really, really important. I think certainly by having that understanding and awareness of the role of standards uh, in healthcare technologies from the outset, this will make a huge difference to, to the innovation and innovators of the, the future. So what have been the successes so far? I think personally for me, the response from the universities to collaborate with BSI has been overwhelmingly positive. And uh, it's just such a, a pleasure to, to really start to engage and collaborate with the universities going forward. Uh, in terms of the 
the kind of great work that we're doing. There are lots of uh, universities that we're collaborating with. So uh, from Strathclyde to Leeds to Harriet Watt, uh, UCL, and really that engagement is across the board. So we've got research proposals that have now been successful in their application processes. And we also have research fellows that are collaborating on, on really kind of deep dive work to do with uh, connected and intelligent medical devices. Um, certainly there are lots of different conversations going on as well, looking at AI and machine learning uh, and synthetic data in digital health innovations. So I think the, the potential uh, is, is really exciting for all of these projects. So what are we going to be working on over the next year or so? The next year looks set for a whole range of activities and projects which we are partnered up on and everything will, will just be starting. Um, the deliverables include things like uh, workshops and standards mapping. Uh, we're also hosting uh, some placements here at BSI as well. So a really exciting uh, 18 months ahead. I also have plans to do lots of traveling and get out there and attend and host in-person events and workshops. Um, but I certainly think with the emerging research and also with engaging with the next generation of, of researchers and, and standards makers, there is so much potential to have a really lasting impact on the health and safety of a future society. So there you have it, a mini European tour of standards education. Now, of course, we couldn't have made this episode without the help of our fantastic colleagues from across Europe, who shared with us some of what they do for standards education through their national standards bodies, and also for sharing with us their standards journeys. So, on behalf of the Standard Show, thank you to Emma from BSI. It's a merci to Odile from Afnor in France. We say tack to both Penila and Sina from Danish Standards. It's gracias to Daniel from Une in Spain. And finally, danke to Amelie from DIN in Germany. A reminder that for more information on what we do to support standards education here at BSI, go to bsigroup.com forward slash education. You have been listening to an episode of The Standard Show with Matthew Childs and Cindy Paragill. Subscribe to us now wherever you get your podcasts. just heard a stripped media production.